So welcome to Tantalizing Teasers on the Cherokee Trail, Western Immigrant History Revealed. I'm Ethan Gannett. I'm the Oregon California Trails Association, Colorado Cherokee Trail Chapter, President and Mapping Chair. Um, and today what I wanted to talk to you about is some kind of fun things that we've been learning while researching uh, the trails this year that we thought we did real. Uh, many of these things are in association with the Northern Colorado Chapter of the Colorado Ar Archaeological Society. Uh, who uh, um, I'm a member of as well. Uh, and so uh, tips off to the hat uh, for many of the projects that they're leading uh, that we've been participating in. Before we launch into these new results, uh, let's let's recover, you know, let's talk a little bit about uh, where we've come from. Just in a few years, we've come a long way. Um, so we've mapped over 60 miles of the Cherokee Trail and Roberts Ranch. Um, we have uh, mapped over two miles of state land board property, and we're in the middle of mapping about three miles of property on the Stonewall Creek Ranch in the north and the Blue Stump Prairie open space in the south. Uh, so very active uh, mapping going on in the last few years. Um, here you can see me pointing out the trail at Blue Stem uh, to some of the members uh, in the field in the south there. Uh, we also uh, have turned in three National tra Trails Office reports, and you might say, well, that's not a lot, Ethan. Well, you know, two of those reports cover 17,000 acres, and a little bit in a second, you're going to see some of the trails that we covered, and it's uh, 16 miles of trails. So it's a lot of work uh, that has gone through over the last couple of years uh, by the Northern team to uh, produce this work. Um, and then, you know, this renewed effort in the South. I'm real happy to have a team that's functioning in the field in the South that's getting out there, seeing everything, uh, mapping a trail, turning in reports. You know, Bruce is, uh, Rodson is new, newly engaged to uh, help them, lead them, uh, get things mapped out, and uh, ultimately turn in reports from the South. Um, the feasibility study that has been ongoing with the National Park Service, well, in 2019, the National Park Service identified um, the Cherokee Trail, uh, the Southern Route, as worthy of National Historic Trail designation. So we're very happy about that and working with legislatures today to um, get that uh, passed in legislation um, so that we can have that National Historic Tres uh, designation for the Cherokee Trail. And then these joint efforts we're doing with the Nash, uh, Northern Colorado chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society on Roberts Ranch. And a lot of what you're going to see here are uh, uh, reports and imagery, imagery from them, artifacts from them. Uh, so thank you to Lori in particular, uh, but also um, um, some of the research of location and the provenance of this has been, been done by ACTA. So it's a shared joint effort. Last thing is, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the videos uh, that we've done over the last year. There's a whole series of Cherokee Trail videos. Go out to the Okta YouTube channel, skip, uh, scroll down a little bit. You'll see the Cherokee Trail series. Underneath there are all the Cherokee Trails uh, videos, as, long as, as well as some additional ones we've done at Roberts Ranch. So take a look, follow, uh, subscribe out there, uh, and learn. And, of course, the Facebook page is out there, too. Uh, you can follow that for the chapter. But there are some tantalizing questions that remain, even on this property, once we finish up uh, the National Parks uh, uh, reports, um, there are some things we're working on this year, and that's what this presentation is about. So here's an example of Roberts Ranch more North, and here's the 11 miles we've been working on up there. Quite an extensive network of trails. The little white crosses are where we've placed the uh, Okta trail signage to mark where the most evident uh, locations are of the trail. Um, and so a lot of work, but I want to draw your attention to the right there where it says Devil's Washboard. And let's zoom in on that. And you'll see a couple features uh, called the Saloon and Blacksmith Shop there. And we were wondering about those. And in conjunction with NCC CAS, uh, thinking about could we do some projects there to maybe um, learn more about uh, the artifacts there and whether or not these really were blacksmith shops and saloons or what they were, right? Because they're right off of the trail. So um, the question we had in mind is, first of all, is that a saloon foundation or is it something else? So we'll talk about that and the artifacts found here. And then second of all, is this where the blacksmith shop was? And what artifacts do we find there? And what proof do we have whether this is a blacksmith shop or not? 
Well, so let's roll back a little bit. Got to do a little historical research, right? And, and where does this idea of a saloon and blacksmith shop come from? Um, well, it comes from a fellow uh, who was a local researcher in northern Colorado here, Richard Baker, in the 1940s. And then Martin Schlue followed it up in the 1980s with his research. And uh, this is the, the title uh, cover of uh, Martin Schlue's work uh, that's in the Fort Collins archives. And he documented it uh, um, in his research in the maps, as well as Richard Baker, um, the existence of the saloon. So here is... Uh, uh, one of the highly detailed annotated uh, topographical maps that Martin has in his research. And you can see he's noting the rock foundation of a saloon at the base of Devil's Washboard, just off the trail there, right? Well, it wasn't just uh, Baker and Schlue that noticed it. Um, it was uh, the Brunings. Um, Herb Brown and Hughes, their uh, maiden names were Bruning, uh, did a book called The Bridger Pass Overland Trail, 1862 to 69, through Colorado and Wyoming and crossroads at the Rawlings Bag Stage Road in Wyoming. Now, they're award-winning in 1990, and I wonder if they're award winner for the longest title ever of a book. Uh, but, um, but this book has in it a reference to the saloon. At the bottom of Devil's Washboard on the west bank of the tributary of Stonewall Creek are the foundation rocks of an old saloon. And this matches exactly where um, Slew shows it in his map. And here we are. This is from Schlue's research. This is a picture of uh, the uh, uh, saloon foundation as it sits in vegetation in the 1980s. And here it is today, uh, May of uh, 2023. This is a CAS project to uh, lay a grid down around um, the, the saloon and uh, do metal detecting and some testing of uh, some digging uh, to determine whether or not uh, you know, this is a saloon or what was it? So first comes all the clearing. And then once it's cleared, that's what it looks like. And it's a very interesting feature, right? It has in the foreground this L feature, right? And then uh, you can see the fellow sitting in the middle of the, the structure um, behind the fellow sitting and in front of the fellow sitting look to be doorways in and out. Um, and um, obviously it's a collapsed wall of some sort. Um, so what is this foundation? What does it represent? So our question is, you know, how do we figure that out? Well, uh, before we get into the artifact results, I did some further research and I was wondering, is there a picture from this time frame that could tell us more? And I, I hit upon this book by Nina Hall Miller. She is A.C. Hull's uh, uh, daughter. And A.C. Hull was a photographer. And he was a photographer in the 1860s. Um, in fact, he ultimately became a photographer for William Henry Jackson. If you note in the background of this slide, you'll be seeing William Henry Jackson uh, uh, paintings. Um, some of these may have been actually taken from original Hull photos. Um, I don't know which, but uh, Hull was definitely a photographer for Jackson. But before then, he actually did his own expeditions and photographed the West and the surviving images uh, that uh, were in his uh, collection were printed in this book um, by his daughter in, uh, called Shutters West. Well, there's a photograph from 1867 from a top of Devil's Washboard. yoo -hoo, right? Pretty exciting. Um, so here's the photograph from a top of Devil's Washboard. And the first thing that you may notice looking down in the valley is this practically looks like a two-lane highway going up the valley from the left and turning up the hill and going off, off back up to the left again. Um, that is the Cherokee and Overland Trail. Um, and it is exactly where uh, the Octa team found the trail. It's still rut evidence today. Um, and so pretty exciting that, you know, here we have a picture showing the trail very evidently uh, from that time frame uh, from 1867. Well, let's go forward to today. Here's a picture of, uh, taken from the Devil's Washboard, sitting a little bit back uh, further on the washboard not as quite forward and not with a zoom lens uh, as much, um, but still a very similar uh, story. And what I've done here is highlight where the saloon foundation is. Now, this is before we cleared the vegetation. And let's zoom in on that. All right, so there's the saloon foundation. And I've located according to nearby large rocks. Uh, and so pay attention to where those nearby large rocks are and those angles between the various different lines. Uh, because that'll come in play in a second. 
Notice also the Cherokee overland ruts are right uh, in this from this perspective behind uh, where the saloon is. Technically, it's in front of the saloon, uh, but from this perspective, they're running right in front of the saloon feature there. All right, well, let's go back and look at Hull's picture. And there is something there. So what is that? Well, there's our three rocks again. There's our three angles again. And there's our feature that's right by the trail. And, you know, to me, it looks like ruins, right? It doesn't look like a standing feature at all. It looks like something that's collapsed in on itself. Um, but it looks pretty substantive, you know, big chunks of either rock or wood or something. And then you can see some graying, uh, some uh, dark gray vegetation in there. But certainly it looks like a, a collapse feature by this time in 1867. So if the structure was in ruins by 67, Martin Schlue actually postulated in his research what the structure might have been used for uh, when he was talking about the Cherokee Station. Now, the Cherokee Station is just a couple miles to the west of this location. Um, it is still located on Roberts Ranch property. There's a Dar monument there today. Um, nothing left of the Cherokee Station other than the monument. Um, but what Schlue said is during the Indian raids, soldiers were actually stationed here, meaning the Cherokee Station. Right. And then he postulates, well, the soldiers, could that explain the temporary saloon on the trail at the washboard? You know, and, and furthering that thought, right, Devil's Washboard and frankly, nearby Steamboat Rock are excellent vantage points to look up and down the valley. You can see for miles, and especially down the valley. Um, and so it, it is it is an excellent vantage point if you're looking for Native Americans coming across, you know, into the area. You could see them from here. So it's possible that there were posts of soldiers, uh, at least um, at those lookout points. Um, could they have been using this uh, this little feature at the bottom, maybe for resting or getting out of the weather or or a saloon? You know, who knows? But um, certainly we know that it looks like it may have been in ruins already by 1867. This time frame we're talking about for the Indian raids was 1864-65. Right. So so it's a couple years prior to the photo by A.C. Hall. All right. So in 2023, Cass started to dig at this location. And as I noted earlier, data is still under analysis. Right. So what I'm going to show here uh, is just a grouping of things together to get a feeling for what what we found. Right. It is not the final analysis. It is not the final identification of these things. Um, and, and in fact, um, you know, we're, we need to wait for the CAS report to finish. And of course, as it finishes, if I can get Joel Laurie and, and her team to coming back and reporting on that to us, um, I certainly will. But I thought you would enjoy the sneak peek. Now, part of the sneak peek is you're, you maybe see something, especially uh, those of you who are historian and artifact historians uh, on, on the channel here. Um, if you see something that you recognize and you know what it is, Hold that thought, note it, write it down, and wait to the end, and we'll do a Q&A. And if we don't get to you in the Q&A, send me a note. Send me an email. I'll forward that to Lori as well, and I'll show my email at the end. Uh, but if you notice something and want to provide additional information, we're going to do a little crowdsourcing here, right? We're going to crowdsource your knowledge of those people watching to say, hey, I know what that item is. I've seen that before. Um, okay, so so let's let's jump in, and let's look at the artifacts from the saloon dig and uh, see what that looks like. Now, this was a very, very big grid, like 160 by 120. Um, so very big grid. Uh, the saloon was the tiny feature in the middle of it. Um, so um, realize that we're collecting things that may have been a result of maybe camping in the area or further settlers after. Um, we don't know yet, right, until they get analyzed and dated. So first of all, we found a lot of fasteners. And those who've ever done metal detecting, you know, you find a lot of square nails, right? Which is great because it's of, of that uh, 19th century. Um, but um, it comes a point where you get too many square nails and you don't bag them all, right? So realize that what you're going to see here are not every single bag square nail, every single square nail at all. Um, and rivets, bolts, all, all sorts of different fasteners. So here's an example of what we're talking about here. So you can see some rivets in here, some ammunition a little bit, some tacks and things, maybe maybe what might be a horse, horseshoe uh, nail, maybe not. Um, lots of different sizes of square nails, um, uh, at least one screw, uh, and you know, little washers and rivets and things. Something that looks like it might be a broken chain link, 
um, square square bolt, uh, square nut, I should say. Um, and then this thing uh, that's being held in the hand, which is a, a looks like a carriage bolt of some sort. Um, it's got threads on one end, and you can see it's kind of twisted at the other end where the hand is. Um, and um, by the way, that was not found in this grid. I put it in this uh, collection because it's it's you know collected there. But um, that was actually found around the corner uh, from from the the uh, saloon grid, um, and we'll that'll come into play a little bit later. So remember the carriage bolt. All right. So if you see something here, let's talk about it later at the Q and A. What else did we see? Well, lots of glass. Well, interesting. This is a saloon nearby. If it was a saloon, well, there's lots of broken glass. In fact, Lori found a midden, uh, what we think is a midden, that we did a test pit in. Um, and there was a plethora of glass, not just in a midden, but, you know, in different places where we did digs as well. Um, so in that blue um, in that blue uh, background uh, section, uh, was a lot of the stuff that was taken out of the midden. Um, and then surrounding that is many of the different midden pieces um, that uh, get photographed as uh, as uh, artifacts. Um, but there are other artifacts here, um, glass artifacts from other locations. So that you can see some green, some brown uh, glass and clear glass. You can see some embossed glass to the right of the blue, uh, which may help date and position what was in that glass, uh, what was in that bottle, um, and where it may have been manufactured at the time. So. A lot of exciting evidence here. Uh, this does not definitively say this is a saloon. It definitively says a lot of glass was broken here, right? All over this location. Um, so who's carrying glass? Why are they carrying glass, you know, in their wagons? Why are they being broken here? And how is that midden used? Um, there's a lot of evidence of horses and, and related gear. And I say related gear because this is not all horses gear. Um, I just kind of collected this together because they're interesting little loops and hooks and and, and buckles and things. Um, but um, you can see things that are clearly, you know, like the upper right-hand corner is probably some sort of shoe buckle. Um, lower left-hand corner is some, probably some sort of class for tightening something. Um, those things that look almost like keys, you know, maybe they are forced... Uh, tightening the straps, maybe on a panyard or or maybe uh, for um, suspenders of some sort. And then there's other things here that might be for reins or something else being held by those things with with two uh, two ends on it. Um, and then you also see the one picture with not a black background is something that's a stick that's been driven in the ground. May or may not have had a piece on top of that at once. Could have been for staking down animals. Could have been for um, you know, marking a, a location, um, who knows? Uh, that one was actually not exhumed because it was so deep in the ground. Um, and then I would point out the lower right-hand corner, which is a horseshoe, may or may not have been a period. Um, this was found near where the carriage bolt was as well. So this is outside of the grid around the saloon, but that also will come into play later. Uh, and then other evidence of humans passing through, you know, spoon handles, the left and right image on the top are the same spoon handle, by the way. So very ornate drawer pool you can see there next to the uh, pin pointer. Um, some things that may be handles of tools or, or, or some sort. And then, of course, ammunition of different types. Lots of ammunition, lots of shells found over the years, over the, uh, the grid search. Um, some evidence of consuming canned meals, so broken can and can topper lids, uh, broken and crushed lids. Um, you know, it'd be great if we could find some dates on these, but uh, we'll see when the analysis is done. And uh, different mechanical parts, big, chunky, thick pieces of metal, uh, some cast iron, um, other pieces of things that looks like pieces of machinery, perhaps something from a rifle in the upper left-hand corner. Um, other things that are, are just uh, maybe lids, you know, of a cast iron um, pot of some sort, bullet, you know, perhaps there, um, and other, other features and other lids and things of uh, big mechanical metal parts. And then last, uh, strapping metal, what I call strapping metal. Um, it could be something else, but uh, as you know, strapping metal was for uh, uh, strapping uh, boxes onto wagons. Uh, interesting, you'll find a lot of this metal that's found is uh, uh, similar in width, um, but uh, what it is, because it's awfully thick, 
um, and how it was used is is unknown at this point. Okay, so there's the artifacts from the saloon dig. What can we uh, uh, conclude from that? Well, until analysis is done, we can't position it, you know, as a you know related to a saloon feature. We can't position it as as uh, even of that time period, but we certainly can say there was human occupation there. A lot of people were through there. It was strewn across that little valley around that uh, saloon foundation feature. Um, and um, certainly um, as the analysis goes on, we will be able to tell perhaps um, maybe from some of those bottles, some uh, manufacturing dates and things that, that allow us to narrow down uh, what was going on and at what time and whether this was maybe a settler artifact or perhaps an immigrant artifact or cavalry artifact for that matter. Okay, so let's move on to the blacksmith shop. Same sort of uh, guidelines here. Um, similarly, the same three historians, Baker, Schlue, and the Brunings, um, noted it. You already saw the map from Schlue. He says there's a rock foundation of a blacksmith shop. And it's kind of around the corner a little bit, nearer to Wheeler Spring. Um, and the Bruning said, in the next draw of the north, uh, to the north of the saloon is the outline of a foundation of another blacksmith shop. Um, and the trail ruts are still visible here. So it's interesting, trail ruts are visible. So it's near, it's very, very near uh, where the trail is. And um, it's the outline of a foundation, which is unclear exactly what that means. Um, and you'll see um, what we struggle with because as we looked to Okta, look to identify where this location was uh, for Martin Schlue, this is the place we settled on. And this is the place that had the most metal hits. So all those little flags are metal hits. Uh, across it. Um, notably, you don't see anything that looks like a foundation, even a foundation outline. Um, now, this place has dealt with uh, many different floods over the years. It's a natural drainage point. Very possible that uh, this has been flooded out over the years. Um, and what's left is, um, you know, was, is it an example of blacksmith shop or not? We'll see in a minute. Um, so you might ask, well, what about AC Hole's picture? It's the same picture, right? You, you should be able to see something there. So there's where we dug using AC Hole's picture, but look what's up further up the ways, and let's zoom in on that. And there's something there, right? Now, what you're seeing is another drainage behind there. So the darkest part is the drainage behind there. In the foreground, you know, in that circle, you see some grays, some very bright white, which may or may not be a rock on that side or a cross on the other side. Um, and then um, and then some darker vegetation, the darker grays. So something there that's light colored, unknown exactly what it is. Could it have just been vegetation? Who knows? What's there today, I can tell you, is pretty much just grass. Um, now, we have not searched this area in, 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 in total looking for anything that could be a foundation. But guess where the carriage bolt and horseshoe was found? This is that area. Um, so um, if we ever get back in the area, we might do a little more digging around there to see uh, and testing around there to see what we might learn from that location. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that D.L. Roberts, who's the patriarch of the Roberts family, this is D.L. here, um, said that, well, his father told him the blacksmith shop and the saloon were actually one in the same structure. So you notice that L, you know, in front of, of uh, the saloon foundation ruins, uh, that, uh, you know, could have been used maybe as a blacksmith shop, you know, maybe. Uh, but certainly we didn't find anything around there that indicated any blacksmith shop. Uh, but anyway, that's the lore. Uh, interesting enough, uh, Martin Schlue and I believe Richard Baker before met the Roberts and talked to them, and they both tended to document the blacksmith shop as separate uh, from the saloon. All right, so um, again, Cass working with Okta, uh, we located where the blacksmith shop probably was, according to Baker and Schlue. And then we did find some artifacts there, as you can tell from the flags, but there was no smoking gun. And in this case, you know, no 50 pound anvil. That's what I wanted to find, right? Because a big 50 pound anvil, it's like, okay, there was a blacksmith shop here. Uh, but no, no finding of that. But, you know, let's look at what we did find there. Um, glass and ceramic shards again, right? So the two on the left and the one on the bottom right, glass shards. The, the one shard uh, repeated on the bottom right almost looks like it has some etching or some, some sun, sun type etching done on it. Um, and then the uh, ceramic shards in the upper right-hand corner 
Um, so it'll be real interesting to see if uh, any of this can be placed by the archaeologists of exactly where, uh, what time frame perhaps those ceramics are from or some of the glass was from. And then, of course, evidence of humans passing through. So different uh, ammunition, uh, bullets, uh, you know, shell casings, some charcoal, um, and um, and also uh, various different uh, uh, pieces like, you know, metal nuts and things. Um, this St. Louis, uh, uh, what looks to be St. Louis uh, uh, chunk of metal was, I actually personally found, uh, I let out a big Yahoo when I pulled it out because you can see it's quite big. Um, and it looks to be maybe part of it's cast iron, so maybe part of uh, something else, right? Uh, maybe either a big stove, uh, like a pot belly stove, or some sort of big oven. Um, so, um, uh, stay tuned, there's more to learn there as that gets perhaps dated by the archaeologists. And I mentioned to say that that was a buckle in the upper right, uh, upper right hand corner as well. Um, all right, so that's what we found there. Again, nothing to indicate a blacksmith shop. You know, a little bit of the charcoal, but nothing to just just screen blacksmith shop, um, nor the foundation that we would expect it. All right, so let's switch gears here. We're going to talk about Steamboat Rock signatures. Uh, this is Steamboat Rock uh, uh, behind me in this image. I'm standing on what's called Tugboat Rock. So Tugboat pulls the steamboat. Um, and um, we wanted to answer the question, is it true there's signatures on Steamboat Rock? Now, the Fletchers are on the phone, uh, know, knew of that and mentioned it to me in the past. Um, others that we've been out with over the years uh, when we're working on Roberts Ranch had mentioned that they um, um, actually went up there as a kid and saw the signatures and had pictures. And um, and so we've got more, more than a few, a handful of folks saying, their signatures up there, including Zach Tho, the, the ranch manager of Roberts Ranch, uh, that you know has got to be, uh, know what he's talking about. Um, so a few of us uh, took it upon ourselves with, the, of course, the permission of Roberts Ranch to uh, scope the, this feature out for the signatures. Now, I'm not going to tell you where the signatures are because uh, the idea is to preserve these, and we don't want people, absolutely don't want people going out here without permissions to go out here. Um, but um, suffice it to say, yes, there are signatures on there. Now, similar to the artifacts, what I'm going to ask of you is as we go through here, again, we're going to do some crowdsourcing, right? Is as we go through here, if you recognize a surname or a set of initials and you're like, I think this might be so and so from history of this time frame, um, let's talk about it in the QA, QA. Um, and again, if we don't have enough time to QA, send me a note, send me an email, uh, and, and we can. Put your information in with everybody else's as the uh, as the analysis goes forward on this. Um, so there are some pretty interesting names here. Um, so let's jump into it. We're just going to look at the names for fun. So anybody wonder why I put this one first, right? 1849. Now, there was no signature next to this, unfortunately. Um, it stood on its own. It, it, uh, there was nothing that was scratched that looked like this next to it. Um, but, of course, this is a very important date to us Cherokee Trail researchers, right, because that is that first year that it was noted as the Cherokee Trail. Uh, and so very interesting that this year is up here. Um, and uh, did somebody get up there and scratch in 1849? Well, who's to know? But there it is. It's there. Um, one of the most ornate ones that are up there is this one by C.H. Gibbs in July 14th, 1876. Now, C.H. had a lot of time on his hands because he even put a decoration, you see, the kind of heart-shaped shield around uh, the, 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 the signature. A um, lot of effort to putting around. You wonder, it's like, why were you spending so much time up here? Was it just to do your signature or was it something else? And in particular, he went up here most likely with T.M. Minor. And I know you can't see the E.R., but it's there in different images. And this was the same date, 1876, July 14th. Um, and so uh, Miner and Gibbs were up there together and spending an awful lot of time scratching their names in the in the, the rock. So what were they doing? Were they looking out from up there? You know, so this warrants further research to understand what these two were doing up here at this time. This is a Shotwell, and this is July 16th, 1883 now. 
and again, I know that July 16th is hard to read. It's hard to get the right angles for everything, uh, but uh, that's uh, the signature here. And interesting enough, somebody else was up here with him on July 16th, 1883, D. Heydrich. Um, so if you notice, again, both of these spent a lot of time carving them in. And so you wonder in 1883 now, what are they doing up there uh, for that amount of time? Was it just to scratch your signatures in or were they doing something else? This is the last dated one I'm going to put up here. Now, there are dated signatures after 1900, um, but I didn't choose to to record those or show those, I should say. I recorded them, but not showing them. Um, but this is a 1900 signature. Um, I liked it just because of the backwards end. Um, so this is either um, someone with initials ANA, most likely, or Anna uh, as a first name. Um, but there is, uh, there is the 1900 signature. So now, now the signatures are going to be uh, without dates uh, on them. And the first one is H. Beach. And this was quite high up, unusually high up. So not quite clear how they climbed up there to do this. Um, but um, interesting thing, as I was doing this presentation, I literally just noticed today, you look off to the right, there is further signature there. Um, so it's very faint, very difficult to see. I, I spent a little time today looking at it. Can't quite pick it out, but I think that's a G. And then it has a lot of uh, letters after it that are partially there. Is that his last name? And it, Beach was his middle name? I don't know. But um, there is something further there to be studied. HHH. Um, I put this in here because uh, well, somebody may know an HHH initials, but this is also looks very, very old, right? It's very worn. It's got patina on it. Um, somebody took the time to put it in there. Um, H H H T Lacey again took a little time to scratch that in. These two uh, together look like they use the same implement, uh, maybe a knife, um, a sharp point at night. So this is L V M Webster and J C Backhill, B A C, maybe two Ks I L L. Uh, uh, so it's Backhill. Uh, so Backhill and Webster probably were up here at the same time um, using the same implement to scratch it in right next to each other. Unfortunately, no date. JJC or JJG with the G upside down. TIK, nicely, nicely etched in. JS Aiken, there is a connection we know on this one. And I'm going to admit somebody right now. Here we go. Um, and FLG. So um, if anybody knows an FLG, I, I like this one only because of the way it was kind of block letters and all lined out very nicely. Uh, this one warrants further investigation to, to look at it again because you can kind of read the E and the F and maybe an R, R and A, a very weird collapsed R, uh, and then another E. And then something beyond that. And you can see it's kind of worn off beyond it. So it needs further research. Could be Ephraim, uh, but not clear exactly uh, what it's saying right now. BFH. Notice they kind of ran out of time on the B. Had to get going. So uh, the F and H got done and the B was kind of partially done. Maybe they meant to do it that way. And this is the only, you know, those, anybody who's been like the registry rock, you see a lot of calligraphic writing, you know, those nice cursive writing. This is the only uh, cursive type of writing we saw up there. And, uh, you know, Lauren and I stared at it for a while and finally concluded that maybe it was Johnson, C. Johnson, uh, J-O-H-N, and the J-O and H are pretty good there. The N is sort of, and then the S-O-N is kind of not as evident, but there are bits and pieces of it. So C. Johnson is the name. All right, so that does it for the signatures. Again, in the Q and A, if you if you happen to know one of those uh, surnames uh, or initials, uh, do let us know. So I'm showing this one. I mean, we're nearing the end here. Um, this is the five miles of uh, Roberts Ranch South trails we did. The reason I'm showing this is that it notice how it all converges up to the left there. Why is it converging? Well, it's going around a place called Grayback Ridge, and that's where we're working right now, and that is. Uh, there's Grayback Ridge on the left. And uh, this is Stonewall Creek Ranch. And this is where we're working on the north right now. It's a very interesting historical ranch. You can see in blue, um, so this is 
actually SLU's topographical map overlaid on a satellite image, along with SLU's actual route uh, that he drew. And now we are in the middle of, of reworking that and trying to find routes across there as well. And so a lot of different mysteries on this ranch. Now, it's fun because this ranch is going to connect further to a state land board and then into the Roberts Ranch North. So we will have contiguous trails going that have been mapped you know, when we finish this all the way from basically Livermore, Colorado, the Forks Ranch area, all the way up to um, Cherokee Station. So it would be real exciting. But some of the mysteries we're working on is, hey, everybody says the trail went around, diary entries said the trail went around, but can we get evidence that somebody went over, right? And at least one of our team members think, well, maybe somebody went over. And, you know, in our late, latest outing, we certainly did find something that looks like somebody tried to go over it rather than around it and trying to forge Stonewall Creek along the way. Um, so that would be a brand new piece of information that none of the historians had recovered. Um, so stay tuned. We'll report on that another time. Another fascinating history of the ranch is this is where the Barlow residence is. And this is actually the preserved Barlow residence uh, in 1871 uh, was when this, the residence was had. And um, uh, they did uh, the uh, Petersons, Ann and Larry are the owners of, of the ranch. Um, and you can see they beautifully... Uh, preserved uh, this this um, Barlow residence by putting a metal roof over it. Well, they'd had the some of the cottonwoods around there fall on and break uh, the residence. So they had enough of that and they um, spent the money to build this uh, nice structure uh, to retain it. So really neat uh, history there. Uh, very interesting to walk through inside. You can see old wide wallpaper, old um, uh, uh, ornate uh, uh, hinges and things. Um, obviously, this is on private property, so uh, nobody can, should go there without the permission of the Petersons. Um, but a lot of history there. And of course, the question comes, what are the Barlows? How do, how do they play in early immigrant history? What role did they play? Um, um, newsflash, he was a blacksmith also. So uh, there may be a blacksmith shop nearby uh, that um, Kaz may or may not uh, work on in the future. So um, there are um, lots of artifacts and history here to be had and to be discovered beyond just the trail. Also, uh, the Petersons are stewards of Livermore Cemetery uh, and they're caretakers of it on the land. Here you can see us walking this Livermore Cemetery. And um, one of the big questions they have is there are unmarked graves there. So who's in those unmarked graves and where are those unmarked graves? So you can see, you know, one of the graves here. Some of the, the uh, tombstones actually go back to the 1870s. Um, so very historic. Uh, again, back in this time frame of usage of the immigrant trail. Um, and um, one of the uh, things I've been working on uh, is actually doing LIDAR imagery of the tombstones. So I'm going to show you just one quick example of the LIDAR imagery. And here we go. Um, this is a LIDAR scan taken with my phone and we're going all the way around. And the idea here is, is for posterity to be able to record now once and for all how the tombstones look today in three dimensions. We have a three dimensional model of it now. So um, that's uh, saved for the future. So if there's future cracks and erosion, uh, we now have the record uh, recorded digitally. Um, the other thing we did, I think I mentioned this was the graves. And so what we did was, uh, Great. We did a brought out a couple different cadaver dog teams, and um, we looked for unmarked graves. And so I'm going to show you uh, an example of uh, one of the cadaver dogs actually working in the field. This is Livermore Cemetery, and uh, this is uh, Jeff Little and his dog Kismet or Kizzy, um, and she is looking and she's smelling and she's beginning to see something. Now every dog has a different alert. And uh, this dog's alert is to lay down. So when she sees finds something, she lays down, and now she's going to get a reward. They're going to mark the site of where she laid down. And um, actually, I just talked to the other handler, Melissa Kent, today. Melissa Kent and Hawk were out on the uh, there as well. They'll be putting together a, a SARDAS report, search and rescue uh, dogs of the United States, um, on where these grave sites were you know, for the Petersons. Um, so real exciting there, uh, the type of work we're doing and the extended kind of 
cross joint effort going on uh, with folks like uh, Sardas. Okay, before we go into the Q&A, just a reminder, there's a Facebook page out there. If you're not a follower already, please go out to Colorado Cherokee Trail Chapter, Oregon California Trails Association. If you see new posts, you're on the right one. Uh, and you can follow that, and then you'll see uh, further updates as we go over time. And also a reminder on those videos, the Okta uh, videos out on YouTube. Go out to Okta's YouTube channel. Scroll down a little bit. Go uh, click on the Cherokee Trail series, and you'll see all of these Cherokee Trail videos that we shot last week, including a couple bonus ones that I shot on uh, trail sleuthing and uh, the hanging of Lewis Musgrove. And there'll be more uh, that we'll do this year as well. And uh, there's my email address. Thank you. I'm, I'm off walking into the field again, down the ruts, looking for more trails. So um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Mm -hmm.